welcome back to the 3D Tinkerer channel. Today, I will teach you some of the methods I use to create this dining room slash kitchen scene in Blender 2.8. But before we get to that, I would like to thank all of my subscribers for getting me to over 100 subs. This channel has only existed for a little over two months and I've already hit 4K channel views and I'm currently sitting at 120 subscribers. I have recently started another trimester of college, so the videos might be coming out at a slower rate, but I will try to keep uploading at least on a monthly basis. So with that said, let's get right into the video. This is the final image for the dining room scene that I will discuss in this video. It took me roughly two to three days to complete, and took me about two thirds of the time to model all the objects in the scene, and about one third of the rest of the time to tweak and revise my scene until I was happy with it. Before you go about making your own interior scene in Blender, the first steps you want to make are to make sure that you get your reference pictures and a general idea of the layout you want for your scene. For my scene, I knew I wanted to create an interior with a kitchen close to the dining room table. So I went to the internet, and I started getting an idea for the layout that I wanted. I also grabbed some pictures off the internet using keywords such as modern dining room or simply dining room table. The cabinets were difficult in particular as many of the pictures I found were obviously 3D models themselves, which makes it difficult for a photorealistic scene. After I collected a decent amount of reference pictures, I placed them in a free program called PureRef, which allowed me to easily zoom in and out on certain pictures on my other monitor. I will place a download link in the video description. After I created a collection of reference pictures, it was time to create my scene. The most important part of creating an interior scene in Blender is getting the units correct. It's best to do this at the very beginning to avoid problems later on such as incorrect proportions or lighting problems. This can be done easily by going to the Scenes tab on the right hand side of the viewport, going to Units, and then setting the unit system to whatever you're comfortable with. Because I live in the US, I want it to go with feet. After you set the appropriate units for your scene, it's time to create a reference human that will help with modeling as well as blocking out the basic aspects of your scene. Starting with the human, you simply tab into edit mode, click on the overlays tab at the top right hand side of the viewport, then check edge length under measurement. This will allow you to see the size of the selected edges, allowing you to simply scale up the object to the desired height. In my case, I decided to make a human approximately 6 feet to match my own height for simplicity. After we create our human, we simply create a plane, then scale the scene to the desired dimensions we want our room to be. Then I duplicate one of the edges from the floor plane in edit mode, press P on the keyboard, and select separate from the pop-up menu. This creates a separate object that will only have the duplicated edge, allowing me to easily distinguish the kitchen floor from the dining room floor after extruding. Then I repeat the process again on the dining room floor to create the walls for the scene. It helps if you enable vertex snapping at the top of the 3D viewport to easily line up to the wall and floors preventing holes between them. I repeat the process one final time for the ceiling, cut some holes in the walls with edge loops, delete the faces, and we are finished blocking out our scene. It is important to note that when you are creating the walls in your scene that you use edge length displayed on the screen as well as the human reference. It also helps to google these lengths to create a more realistic scene. After you've finished blocking out your scene, you have to populate it bit by bit with 3D models. If you have the budget for it, I highly recommend purchasing pre-made models as it will save you a large sum of time and effort. But, being the broke college student that I am, I decided to make all of the models in this scene. I started with the table, created a cube primitive, and scaled it into a rectangle in edit mode. I also added a loop cut to make the edge of the table less of a perfect curve and also hiding the texture seam making the object look more believable as a realistic table. I also modeled the legs as they are a basic cross-section of rectangles with a large block on the middle for stability. Perhaps the most difficult object in the entire scene was the table chairs. Because of the many wood segments visible, in addition to their natural curvy surface, I spent most of my time perfecting the chair model as it covers a large portion of the screen and will be duplicated showing many different angles. Even though the chair is fairly basic in design, the object needed to be made of many different segments to give the appearance that was made of smaller pieces instead of one continuous model. To make it easier on myself, I used curves to create the back supports of the chair and a subdivision surface modifier to create the organic seat and chair back. In order to use the curves, I set the fill type to full and tweaked the extrude and depth sliders until I had a basic blocky shape. Then I hit F3 converted it to a mesh, deleted the unnecessary edges, 
reconnected them with a bridge edge loop command, and removed doubles to create a solid mesh for the chair legs. The chair seat was simply a rectangle that I tweaked the vertices of until I got the desired look, and the back of the chair was a rectangle with a hole in the middle and a subdivision surface modifier on both. With the chair finished, I added a bevel modifier to it, tweaking the bevel width to an appealing value. Then I selected angle under the limit method to guarantee that only the hard edges of the object were beveled. This gives the appearance that the model is made of a bunch of smaller pieces without having to go back and bevel several edges manually. The cabinets were rather simple, as they were simply a rectangle with fake cabinet doors on the front. The doors were created with a rectangle that was inset with the I hotkey and extruded. I then scaled the doors to different proportions in edit mode to save time. For the handles, I blocked out the basic shape and then applied a subdivision surface modifier. The fridge was also rather easy to model as well. I simply created the general shape and then added a subdivision surface modifier, adding edge loops on certain sides to give a sharper appearance. The handles were made the exact same way for the fridge as they were for the cabinet doors. One important thing that I would like to point out is that if you plan on only showing a still of your scene, you should only model the objects that are seen by your camera. This might seem obvious, but something that I didn't consider until I already created a dishwasher for my scene. Oops. One element of my scene that is unique to everything else is the chandelier above the dining room table. This object is also a reference picture that I found online. For this object, I used a particle system to randomly place the light bulbs on a simple UV sphere. To do this, I started by making a basic shape of the extruded part that holds the light bulb. Then I set the origin point to the part's base so that it will protrude from the sphere's surface at that origin point. After I create the sphere and add a new particle system, I set the render type to object and select the light. Then I tweak the scale and move the particle object out of the scene so it won't show up in the render. The chain was easy to make as well. I simply created a cylinder rotated it 90 degrees, scaled it on the z-axis, applied a solidify modifier to give it the depth, and a subdivision surface modifier to smooth out the edges. In order to make the rest of the chain, I applied an array modifier and used an empty to rotate the elements and set the offset. Now I can make the chain as long as I want with the click of a button. Also, before I forget to mention them, the plate models were very basic. The plates were cylinders that I extruded and scaled to get the desired shape. The material was also very basic. I simply set the default principled shader's roughness to zero and I had a clean reflective plate material. The windows were also straightforward after creating the basic frame. The glass, however, was a little difficult. The problem with Blender is that when light passes through glass, it can make the interior scenes very noisy. So I used a node hack on screen to allow light to pass through the glass shader while keeping the realistic glass look. One more object that I almost glossed over was the white molding that is covering the transition from the floor to the walls in the scene. This object was easily created with an edge loop on the wall object that was then separated using the same duplicate and separate method that I used previously. I then added a solidify modifier to it, adding a bit of depth. I could also continue to extrude the plane easily, and the solidify modifier would non-destructively update the object's thickness. One of the key aspects to photorealism in Blender is having realistic PBR textures to apply to your objects. If you have a budget and want to get only premium textures, the website that I recommend is none other than Polygon.com. I'm not sponsored by this site, but I've used their textures in the past and they are very high quality with little compromise. If you're looking for a free alternative, I recommend checking out ccotextures.com for decent quality textures for the low, low price of 100% free. While I was creating the objects in the scene, I added materials to them after I finished them one at a time. If you're unaware how to use Blender's principal BSDF shader, please watch the Blender Guru video explaining how each setting works in detail, as this shader is the foundation for creating realistic shaders in the modern version of Blender. In the meantime, I will go over how to quickly import textures from the internet. Make sure you have the Node Wrangler add-on enabled in your settings, and all you have to do is simply press Control shift t while the principal shader node is selected to open the Quick Start menu. Simply select all the included files and hit Accept, and your PBR texture will be instantly set up with all the mapping nodes included. You can use the mapping node to rotate any textures that aren't facing the right way in your object. Otherwise, you have to rotate the UV faces themselves. Before we get to rendering our scene, we first need to talk about lighting. If you want to achieve a photorealistic look in your scene, you need to properly light your scene to show off those fancy textures. 
While mesh lights via the emission shader are cool, they're usually pretty taxing in render times, so I highly recommend using basic lights such as point lights or spotlights if available for your scene layout. In this scene, I was forced to use mesh lights for the chandelier, but I used point lights in the darker parts of the scene, being the kitchen. I do, however, use mesh lights under the cabinets because I wanted to achieve a long cylindrical tube light that you can see present in the final render. Another alternative for external lighting is to light your scene with an HDRI. For those unaware, an HDRI is a 360 degree environment texture with realistic exposure levels to simulate reflections and light in the real world. A great free resource for HDRIs is hdrihaven.com. They offer high quality HDRIs with resolutions all the way up to 16K. The best part is that they are 100% free. I did use an HDRI in my scene, but it was only to give a realistic exterior to my scene with a small amount of light visible on the window frame. One more important thing to note is that when you light your scene, you want to experiment with different feels of lighting. For my scene, I made sure when I did the revision that I used a realistic warm light to help make the scene feel more inviting. When I finished creating all the models for my scene and I was happy with the lighting, the next step was to render out the final image. So I placed a new camera into the scene, then I hit 0 on the numpad to snap the 3D viewport to the camera view, hit N on the keyboard to open up the right viewport panel, and checked the lock camera to view checkbox. This allows me to move the camera around the 3D viewport with the same controls I use to navigate the 3D viewport regularly. Once I get a good angle on my scene, I then change the camera focal length to increase the FOV of my scene, making sure I didn't leave out any of the important bits. I rendered out a test image, and when I was sure that there weren't any problems with the scene, I configured the render settings for my final render. For the final image, I used a resolution of 4K at 75% scale. I set the samples to 1500 to minimize the noise in the scene due to the poor performance of interior scenes, and I also set the light bounces for my scene. And making sure that my compute device was set to GPU, I rendered the final image. The final render would take me about an hour to complete, but I used an open source render farm called Sheepit to get the render done in about half an hour. Sheepit also allows you to render animations, which is great for interior scenes. So guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. This was a new type of video, so please leave any constructive criticism down below and I'll keep a close eye on the comments. This video did take a lot longer to, to produce, so I'm going to see what reaction it gets and base my future content around that. So again, if you have any comments, please leave them down below and uh, subscribe for more content and leave a like if you enjoyed. Have a good one.